All right, so now continuing our uh, talk about redox reactions, we're going to take a look at this sodium and chloride reaction. So here we have sodium solid, that's a sodium metal, plus chlorine gas, that's our yellow-green, very toxic gas. In fact, it can be fatal, and that's what happened in that accident at Buffalo Wild Wings. They accidentally created chlorine gas, which put one person in the hospital and unfortunately killed another person. So a metal that is explosive with water mixed with a very toxic, potentially fatal gas can actually make sodium chloride our table salt, which is crazy. All right, this is another version of a redox reaction. So I want to write out this redox reaction, and I'm going to start with sodium. And sodium, I'm going to assume to have a charge or oxidation number of zero. So this follows what we talked about in the previous video, and that is an element all by itself in its standard state. If it does not have a charge, we assume that charge to be a zero. All right, now on the product side, I'm going to take a look at the sodium that's inside this ionic compound. So we know that inside of ionic compounds, our ions do have charges. Sodium is predictably a plus one, and chloride is predictably a negative one. So I'm going to say our sodium started out at zero. It was nice neutral sodium, and now it becomes a plus one. Just to keep the balancing of the equation, I'm going to go ahead and put a two for both of those. Next up, I'm going to do chlorine. So here is Cl2. And Cl2 originally had a zero or no charge at all. So oxidation number or charge of zero. And again, I figured that out because it is all by itself in its standard state. And it did not list a charge. Therefore, we assume that charge to be a zero. All right, so on the product side now, I have Cl and it has its predictable charge of a minus one. And I'm gonna balance it out with a two right here. So what I've just written is what we call half reactions. You don't need to worry about it until you get to Chem 1B next semester, but that's just the name of what we've done here. All right. So earlier we talked about, or I should say in the previous video, we talked about electrons. And we said that if something's becoming more positive, it's more positive because it has lost electrons. So here's an electron that got lost, but really there's going to be two electrons that are lost. That's because every sodium is a plus one, and we've got two of them. That's how we get to two electrons here. All right, now for our chlorine, the only way chlorine became more negative is that it took electrons in. So I'm going to say that it took in two electrons, and the reason I'm saying two electrons is because we have two chlorines. Each one took in one so they took in a total of two. All right, so now let's take a moment and write out which one of these is an oxidation and which one is a reduction. So I'm gonna use the second method because I actually think that one's easier. Again, you can use whichever method um, you like. Here, it goes from a zero to a negative one, so numerically that's a reduction, therefore I'm gonna call this a reduction. So grammatically, we can say this is a reduction reaction, or we can say chlorine was reduced. Either way, reduced or reduction works. All right, so next up, sodium started at a zero and then went to a positive one, so its charge increased. So I'm going to call that an oxidation. Let me move these over just a little bit. So again, just some grammar, you can say that this is an oxidation reaction, or you can say that sodium was oxidized. All right, so now there's something else I need to tell you about this reaction. So I mentioned once upon a time in the previous video that they need each other, that the oxidation can't happen without the reduction, the reduction can't happen without oxidation. So that's why we call this redox or oxidation or reduction reactions. They must occur together. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little story just to help you remember this. Those of you who don't like my analogies, feel free to put your hands over your ears and just la, 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 and forget. All right, but I'm going to tell you a story about little sodium. So sodium, the good student, puts all its electrons in its backpack, trots down the road to go to school. Parents are very proud. Bye, sodium. Have a wonderful day. Make friends. And sodium's going down the road to school. Now, sodium later on, 
trots down the, ha- the road coming back home and its parents go through its backpack and they're like, sodium, where are your electrons? You lost your electrons. Did you drop them somewhere? And sodium's like, no, really, it wasn't my fault. I was just walking. I was on my way home and chlorine jumped me and stole my electrons. Now, chlorine has a different story to tell, of course. So chlorine, also good little chlorine, all its electrons in its backpack, walking down the road to school, then later comes home and its parents going through its backpack. And it's like, chlorine, why do you have some extra electrons in here? These don't belong to you. And chlorine, you know, good chlorine gives, gets into tears. Says, I swear it's not my fault. I was walking down the road and sodium jumped me. Sodium t- pulled the backpack off of me, threw electrons in and made me carry them home. I didn't want to do it. Sodium made me do it. Well, they're actually both telling the truth. They needed each other for this reaction to happen. So let's take the example of innocent little chlorine. So chlorine was reduced because of the electrons that it got, but it got those from sodium. So sodium forced chlorine to be reduced. Because of that, I'm gonna call sodium the reducing agent. So there I put RA, and let me label right here RA, is a reducing agent. In industry, it's more commonly referred to as a reducer. And I know you think I'm joking, and I sort of am with mean sodium who jumped chlorine and forced those electrons upon it, but we do have chemicals that we call strong reducers. Those reducers have to be kept separate from other chemicals because they really will force other chemicals to take their electrons. And in doing so, they can sometimes have very explosive reactions. So a strong reducer has to be kept isolated. So even in a stock room, we will often put it in its own little styrofoam cage. And the idea is if there's an earthquake and anything starts to shake, we do not want that strong reducer getting near the other chemicals because it forces a chemical reaction. All right, so now we're thinking sodium's a bad chemical, but that's not necessarily the truth. So sodium was oxidized but it could not have been oxidized unless chlorine agreed to take those electrons. So sodium cannot just throw its electrons up into the air and see who catches them. It's gotta actually give them to somebody and someone has to be willing to take them in. So sodium was oxidized, but it was only oxidized because chlorine agreed to take the electrons. So we can call chlorine an oxidizing agent or OA. So the OA is the oxidizing agent, also known as an oxidizer. So in industry, it's more, much more commonly referred to as an oxidizer, but I believe your textbook refers to it as an oxidizing agent. So oxidizing agents are also very dangerous chemicals that have to be kept isolated. So again, in our stock room, even within our cabinet where we keep, say, our strong acids away from everything else, some of our strong acids are oxidizers because they have some different properties. So for example, nitric acid is a strong oxidizer. And again, we have sort of a styrofoam cage that we use to keep it away from things like hydrochloric and sulfuric acid because in the case of a earthquake where they're getting moved around, we do not want that strong oxidizer to react with anything. So if a strong oxidizer were to contact another chemical, there's a very good chance it will force a chemical reaction. And the chemical reaction it is gonna force is the oxidation. So essentially it's gonna strip the electrons off of something else. And again, those are very exothermic reactions. In other words, those reactions often go boom, which is not something we want. So the oxidizing agent can force the other the other uh, element to react, but the reducing agent can also force an other uh, element to be reduced. So these two can force each other to play the game, um, but they do both to some extent have to be willing to do it. So in other words, both little sodium and little chlorine are in trouble with their parents. (laughs) Okay, so that story was just to help you to remember that, oops, let's go ahead and use gray. Whichever element, in this case sodium, was oxidized, it is the reducing agent. So notice we have the opposite things together. 
So if an element is oxidized, it went underwent oxidation, it is then the reducing agent. And if an element was reduced, it underwent a reduction reaction, then it is the oxidizing agent. So we have the opposites together there. So now let's look at a slide where we summarize that. All right. In every redox reaction, something is oxidized and something is reduced. So that we already knew. But here's the new part. The species being oxidized helps to reduce the other agent, and therefore it is the reducing agent. The species being reduced helps to oxidize the other species, and therefore it is the oxidizing agent. So in other words, the reducing agent is oxidized, and the oxidizing agent is reduced. All right, so let's go back to the problem we looked at way back at the beginning of this video. Or actually, I apologize, at the beginning of the last video. And let's see if we can find our oxidizing agent and reducing agent. So first of all, those agents are always reactants, never products. So I'm going to take a look at calcium first. And I see calcium was underwent an oxidation because it was oxidized. Therefore, it is the reducing agent. Now, oxygen underwent a reduction reaction. Therefore, it is the oxidizing agent. So again, the opposites are connected. Since ox oxygen was reduced, it is the oxidizing agent. Since calcium was oxidized, it is the reducing agent. So I know that takes a little while to get used to, but let me know if you have any questions. All right, so oops, let's give a few of these a try. So we again are going to find our oxidation reaction, our reduction reaction, and then we're gonna go on to find what is our oxidizing agent and reducing agent. All right, so here we have H2 plus O2 going on to form water. And it looks like I did not balance this properly. There should be a two in front of hydrogen. I apologize, let me get that up here as well. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is take those two hydrogens, and again, because there's no charge given and it's all by itself, I'm gonna assume that to be a zero. And then I'm gonna think about what is the predictable charge for hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen has a predictable charge or a predictable oxidation state of one. Oxygen has a predictable charge or oxidation state of negative two. So over here, I'm gonna say I have a total of four hydrogens that have a plus one charge or oxidation state. Next up, I'm gonna look at my O2, and I'm gonna say originally it has an oxidation state or a charge of zero, because it's listed by itself, and there's no charge given. And then on the product side, here, I'm gonna say that oxygen has a negative two charge and we've got two of them. So here, I'm gonna use that second method because again, I do think it's easier just to take a look at the charges. And I see oxygen went from a zero to a negative two. So it went down in its charge or oxidation number. So I'm gonna call this a reduction. That means the other one must be an oxidation, but let's go ahead and verify it. So from a zero to a plus one, that is an increase in that charge or oxidation number. So that one is an oxidation. All right, so now let's look at that oxygen again. So oxygen underwent a reduction reaction, therefore it is the oxidizing agent. And again, it's always the reactant, so it will be O2, not that O2 minus. Here, our hydrogen underwent an oxidation reaction. So this H2 right here, that will be our reducing agent. So again, it's got to be the reactant, never the product. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our next example. All right, so our next example looks a little crazy, 
but I know that you all can do this. The first thing you want to do is scan to see if there's anything you could quickly pick out that has changed its charge. And if you were to do that, on the right hand side you would see that iodine has a charge of zero because it's all by itself and there's no charge listed. And on the other side there's a negative charge. So iodine has changed its charge, therefore it's part of this uh, oxidation reduction reaction. Now, uh, earlier the question was asked, hey, could there ever be more than two? And in the grand scheme of the world, yes, there can be an infinite number, but in this class, you will only have two things changing their charge. One will be your oxidation and the other will be your reduction. All right, so let's give this a shot. So the I minus is going on to form I2. And if we wanna balance this out, I'll go ahead and do this. Now we've got to find something else in there that's changing its charge. Now there's a lot of things that we can try to find here, but what I'm going to recommend is always be suspicious of transition metals. You learned back when we did nomenclature that they can change their charge and in a redox reaction they're very, very likely to do so. So here is chromium and here's another chromium. Now the chromium on the right, not a problem, we know it's a three plus. Chromium on the left, sort of a problem. We've got to figure out what, uh, what charge it is or what oxidation number it is. So that's what we're going to do. This is our dichromate, Cr2O72 minus. And we're going to figure out what the oxidation state of that chromium is. All right, so we have two of our chromiums. And we have seven of our oxygens. So I don't know what chromium is, so I'm going to put an X here, but I do know that I have two of them. So two times that X plus seven times negative two. So we assume oxygen to be a negative two unless you have evidence for it to be a different. And then we're going to set this equal to negative two as well. And that is because of the negative two charge. right over here. All right, so because dichromate as an ion has an overall charge of negative two, that's why we set it equal to the negative two. All right, so now from here, let's go ahead and solve. So we got two X plus negative 14 equals negative two. I'm gonna add 14 to both sides. And then it looks like two X equals 12. If I divide by two on both sides, our X is going to be equal to six. So what I'm gonna say is that chromium has an oxidation number of six in this compound. So just for fun, let's write that out. Oops. So our chromium is a plus six. And again, I'm writing the plus six for emphasis and that, that that's just kind of normally the way we write it, but if you were to write a six, I would assume that to be positive if it didn't have a negative sign. All right, and the oxygen was a minus two. All right, so now let's go back up and take a look at what's going on in our equation. So we said this chromium right here has an oxidation number of plus six. And over here, it has a plus three. So something has changed, therefore it's involved in the redox reaction. And I'm gonna go ahead and say Cr2O72 minus, going on to form two Cr3 plus. All right, so I know that second equation doesn't look balanced and it's not. Balancing redox reactions is quite involved and that's something you'll do next semester. If you guys are super excited about it, I'm happy to show you how to do it. Um, but for right now, let's go ahead and focus on our redox. So I'm going to go ahead and write in what we found, and that's the chromium was a plus 6. So now if I look at plus 6 going to plus 3, that is a reduction numerically because we are falling. We're going to a lower number. So even though we're not going to a 0 or a negative number, it still qualifies as a reduction because we are getting lower. So this is our reduction. 
which means iodine should be our oxidation. And if we go from a negative one to a zero, we are indeed going up and that makes it an oxidation. All right, so now we have to find our reducing agent and our oxidizing agent. So iodine was involved in the oxidation. That means the reactant here was our reducing agent. Next up, chromium was involved in the reduction. And that makes dichromate the oxidizing agent. All right. So if you wanted to get into the details, it is true. It's the chromium 6 plus. That is the true oxidizing agent. That is the true thing that is the kind of the business end of that ion. But in common speak, we would say it is the entire chemical because if you have dichromate, it is a very strong oxidizer. So we speak of dichromate as a whole of, as being that oxidizing agent, even though it is true, it's the chromium six plus that is the business end that is, you know, the, uh, the one doing the action here. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. It is always our two reactants here. Oops. No. This and this right here that become the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. And whichever chemical underwent the oxidation, that is your reducing agent. Whichever chemical underwent the reduction, that is your oxidizing agent. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know. All right, so here's another problem. And I am going to strongly recommend that you pause the video and you take a look at this and see if you can figure it out. You're doing the exact same thing as we did before. You're finding the oxidation re reaction, the reduction reaction, and then you're finding the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. All right, so my hope is that you just pause the video. You spent lots of good, fun time figuring this out, and now we are all back together. All right, so the first thing we want to do is see if we can easily figure out anything that's changed its charge. And I see Br with a negative sign, and I see Br with nothing, which is going to mean it is a zero. It is neutral. So right away, I know bromine is involved. So I'm going to go ahead and say my 10 Br minus go on to 5 Br2 that is neutral. All right, so the next thing I told you to be suspicious of is transition metals. So here I see a manganese, and it's got a 2 plus charge. And here I see a manganese, but I don't know what its oxidation number is, so we're going to figure that out. And when we do that, we're not going to look at the 2. We're only going to look at the permanganate. All right, so MnO4 minus, we've got one manganese, we've got four of our oxygen. We don't know what manganese is, so I'm going to put an X here. I know that we have four oxygen, and we assume those to be a minus two, unless you have evidence to contradict that. And I'm going to say it's equal to a negative one. The negative one comes from this negative sign right here. All right, so let's go ahead and solve this. So we have X plus, and it looks like a negative eight equals negative one going to add that 8 to both sides, and it looks like our x is going to be a plus 7. So let's write out our oxidation numbers. So the manganese inside of that permanganate is a plus 7, and the oxygen is a negative 2. So we were doing this to find our permanganate, oh, I'm sorry, our manganese inside of the permanganate. So let's go back and take a look at that. All right, so the manganese right over here, we've just said that that is a plus seven. So the manganese is a plus seven on the left and it is a plus two on the right. Oops, go back to the blue. So MN 
O4 minus, and I'll go ahead and put the 2 in for balancing, becomes 2MN2 plus, and we know that inside that permanganate, there was a plus 7. All right, so let's take a look at our permanganate going to manganese. A 7 went down to form a 2. So that is a reduction. Our charge was lowered. So I'm going to say reduction. So mathematically, that charge was reduced or lowered. And then for the bromine, from a negative 1 to a 0, the charge increased. So I'm going to call this an oxidation. All right, so next up, we are trying to find our oxidizing agent and reducing agent. If you haven't done that yet, again, I'm gonna highly recommend that you pause the video, give that a shot, and then uh, turn the video back on when you are ready. All right, so I'm hoping everybody got a chance to at least give a guess on your oxidizing agent and reducing agent. I'm gonna start at the bottom. This is a reduction, therefore this entire thing is the oxidizing agent. Again, what I know is the business end of that permanganate is the manganese 7 plus. It's really the manganese 7 plus that does the job, but we refer to our oxidizing agent as that entire uh, compound there or that entire polyatomic ion. All right, so next up we have oxidation. And so oxidation for the Br minus means that the Br minus is the reducing agent. So it's Br minus that forced the reduction in permanganate, and it is permanganate that forced the oxidation in Br minus. All right, so I'm hoping these are starting to make sense a little bit. All right, so I am going to go ahead and pause the video here, or actually stop the video here, because I'm just making nice bite-sized chunks, so I'm hoping these will load a little easier for you. And I will see you soon in the next